Happy New Year and welcome to the Alex Salmon Show where we bid a final and fond farewell to 2019 by looking at some of our programme highlights from the old year. It was a political year totally dominated by Brexit, but we took the opportunity to offer the viewers a welcome break when we could. Alex, what was your top interview from 2019 that was show business related as opposed to political business? Well, I had the, the chance to uh, interview royalty, my all-time boyhood greatest ever hero, Robert the Bruce, uh, in the form of uh, Angus McFadgen, whose new film, On the Bruce, top billed the Edinburgh International Film Festival last summer. comes to a fight, some of us might not see the sunset, but that is the true nature of war. But know this, I see now in your eyes what Scotland can be. You've felt her fear and her rage. You've heard the roar of her soul. You've wept her tears and you've shed her blood and you have touched the cold, cruel skin of her death. We have known Scotland clutched in the grip of a mighty hand and now we'll set her free. Is that not worth fighting for? I... I... You got a, a, a huge break in... Uh the uh, international blockbuster Braveheart, and, and you played uh, Robert the Bruce. I was asked to come in for the English Prince in it, and I said, uh, and, the, and the casting director, Patsy Pollock, said, now, now, are you going to play Robert the Bruce? But you can't, because it's been offered to a movie star, so forget about that. Come in and meet Mel and talk about this role. So what did I do? I went in, having not worked for nine months, uh, and, I, and he said, so, you want to talk about this uh, role of the English queen? I said, no, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm, I'm here to talk about Robert the Bruce. So you're telling me you could have been Edward II yes. as opposed to Scotland. <laughs> That's correct. King. That's correct. <laughs> and I was in there for an hour and a half, and he was, like, looking at me going, looking at the casting director, like, why is he talking about this? And uh, he said, so, OK, well, it was great to meet you. You don't want to talk about the other guy? I said, no, I'm, I'm good. Good luck with your movie. And I left and kicked myself for... Days afterwards, thinking, I haven't worked for nine months, what am I doing? Uh, but I got a phone call ten days later, and I was asked to come back to see him. I was like, Christ, what have I done now? I've done something wrong, you know? And uh, it turned out that the actor who'd been offered the role was trying to get uh, a role in the other Scottish film, which was being made at the time, the Rob Roy one, mm -hmm. which was considered the more superior, superior script. So everybody wanted to be in the other one. This one was like the cheesy Hollywood thing, right? Uh, so I got invited back, and it turned out that this other actor had let the, go, the day go by by which he should have accepted the offer, so they withdrew it and gave it to me. So there was a sort of element of destiny in that. What a great movie from the Bruce. <laughs> and of course, if it hadn't been for Angus McFadden's determination to play Robert the Bruce and the coincidence of the Liam Neeson Rob Roy film, he could have ended up playing that unfortunate English King Edward II, who I remember came to a very sticky end. So Taz, what was your showbiz highlight? Well, my favourite is the one actor who managed to appear in both Rob Roy and mm. Braveheart and is now riding the crest of a wave in the hit show Succession. And this week, he's just won the Golden Globe Award for the best actor in a drama series. The connection between Brian Cox and his fictional character, Logan Roy, is of course, that both hail from the city of Dundee. Let's have another look. Brian Cox, let's start with Succession, this HBO sensation which has uh, stormed through this year. Another series set up for, for next year, I understand. Yeah, we stand. start in January. And you play Logan Roy, the Logan ruthless Roy. patriarch head of this media family. How, how difficult was that? 
<laughs> How difficult. How difficult it is to be ruthless and patriarchic. Well, I have children, <laughs> and I know what it's like to be a father, so that's, uh, that's part of it. Well, of course, you're twice rector of uh, Dundee uh, University, and, I am, yeah. uh, and many, many, many visits back to the, to the city. But recently, to, to see the, the new Victorian Albert uh, yeah. opened in the, the banks of the Tay, yeah. what's your first impressions of the v and in Dundee? Well, I think it's tremendous. I mean, you know, I, I think that there's, you know, the, there'll always be the complainers and the, the moaners and what have you, but I, I, I think it's stunning. But the analogy's been drawn with the Guggenheim and Bilbao, yeah. and you think it'll be as influential for the city of Dundee as I, I, I Guggenheim was in Bilbao? Yeah, I think it could be. I mean, I think it, it needs, it's all the ancillary stuff that goes with it, the businesses that it will attract. And, you know, the, the figures in terms of, you know, uh, who's going to come. And it, it seems to be it's doing quite well, I think, you know, that the people are, are, are attending it. But you think we're Dundee, I mean, a very working class city, a Scots city, an yeah. Irish city in yeah. many ways as well. Very Irish, yeah. But uh, why is it that a city like Dundee, strongly yes in the Scottish referendum yeah. for independence, strongly pro-Europe in the European referendum, yeah. What's the contrast between, for example, a, a city in the north of England, which uh, many of which uh, I, I veered towards a, a no vote in the European referendum? Yeah, I think there's a zeitgeist at work. And the zeitgeist is that it's the same thing that elected Trump in America. I think really what happened was that th there's a disaffection with politics. And Dundee is quite a proud city because it is the yes city of Scotland. You know, we, we're still very proud of our... Our, that was the biggest vote for independence yeah, in the Scottish referendum absolutely. in 2014. Absolutely. And, and also, it is not incompatible with our European nature, because Scotland generally has much been much more Europe conscious than England has. It's just, you know, we're less xenophobic. We, that's the nature of our being. You know, we're egalitarian in principle. You know, we have been tribal in our time, but we really are egalitarian, and we're very welcoming. You know, we love people coming to our country. We welcome people in. We're canny at the best of times. But also, I think what happened, that there was this real... What happened in the North was... And you see it now. I mean, the Brexit thing is such a mess. It really is a mess. And you see the amount of treachery and self-serving that's gone on with people like Boris Johnson, Gove, and then your feudalist Rhys Mogg. Would Logan Roy be able to sort them out? Ah, uh, Logan Roy would, just, he would, he would kick their asses from here to, to, um, yesterday. I mean, he wouldn't put up with it at all. Because they're just, they're basically, they're divisive and they're self-serving in the wrong way. They don't serve the community, they serve themselves. And I think that that's, ironically, that is what the, they felt up in north that they weren't being served. So, of course, people like Farage waved the fans of Brexit and said, well, you know, what? Well, it's blame the others, blame them, blame that. That's what does it. Of course, even the hard-working Brian Cox hasn't had as many roles as our next feature star, the wonderful Debbie Arnold, a lady who has appeared in just about every soap opera in the UK. However, when Debbie came in with her daughters, she was speaking not about the glitz and glamour, but their efforts on the key issues of homelessness. With the universal credit, you know, it just takes two weeks for somebody to be turfed out of where they were living. And I think the thing what Dan is doing with Buses for the Homeless, he's making little pods within London buses, and that not only are they giving some people somewhere to live, they're also bringing in people to, to you know, rehabilitate them into society again, to get them jobs, to get back in there. I, I mean, I cannot imagine what it must be like to have had some of these people have been, you know, wealthy, had good jobs, and now they have nothing. They're ashamed, they don't want to go home. I can't imagine what it must be like. It's, it must be a nightmare. But Debbie, you've been involved in these initiatives for a long time. Yeah. Well, what's the kind of essential, I mean, apart from being very proud of your, your daughters for, for, for putting their shoulders to the wheel, what, what would be your insight, what, your lesson about trying to deliver practical help to people? Well, I think that's the most important, you know, as they say, you know, give a man a fish, he eats for a day, teach a man to fish, and he eats for life. We've got to bring people back to society and show them what to do. I mean, an iPhone today is enough for you to make a living on. It's, you know, something that you can do. People, everyone that's homeless could really do something and make some money. They just need to know how. They need to be taught. They need to be integrated back into society. And, I, and that, that is what Dan is doing, and that's what we're trying to help. Debbie is a powerhouse in every respect. Of course, they say that politics is showbiz for boring people, but there have been people who have made the transition without becoming boring at all. 
In our series on the politics of protest, we came across Red Saunders, the artist who devised the seminal Rock Against Racism campaign in the late 1970s. Boring, Red is not. Now, 40 years after its first launch, Rock Against Racism has acquired folklore status and become the, the template for many later movements, mobilising the music industry to promote great causes. Now, I'm joined by the man behind that initiative, Red Saunders, to talk about protest then and now. So, Rock Against Racism, that's way back to 1976. What was the genesis behind uh, Rock Against Racism? It was a really simple thing, actually, Alex. It was a, an outburst by the guitar god Eric Clapton, who made a complete racist outburst supporting Enoch Powell at a concert in Birmingham. It was reported in the music press. I was an old Eric Clapton fan. I had all his records and everything. And I was outraged, because that music is based on black music. So I wrote a letter. And I wrote a letter proposing that we started a campaign against racism in music to bring black and white musicians together called Rock Against Racism. And that was in the New Musical Express, New which Musical was Express. The, the Bible of, uh, yeah. of, of music. And, and the think. Melody Maker and Sounds and Black Echoes and the Left Press. So how did, that was it. You're telling me this mass movement started with a, a letter. A letter. And I, I really thought not much about it. I mean, I was angry, so I wrote the letter and it was done. I don't write letters very often, you know. And uh, I didn't really think about it much. And somebody called me up at... Um, it was an old friend of mine who was a journalist, and he called up and said, oh, he'd organised a P.O. box to replies to be addressed to. And he said, there's, uh, there's 400 letters here. I went, what? What are you talking about? And that was it. Now, for the benefit of the viewers, this is long before the internet, long before email, where you, you set up a, a, a post box to get the response to yeah, your absolutely. rallying cry. Yeah, and you, you say in those days, you set up a post box because you didn't put an individual address, because if you did, the NF would be firebombing your address. These were dangerous times. So we had set up a post box. So we were stunned when we got... And the letters were just amazing. So what was your message back to, to, well, to the people who rallied one, to the banner? I remember one particular letter from a young uh, a school student, a young girl in Aberystwyth. And she wrote, and she said, I read your letter in Melody Maker, and she said, I've got a geography teacher who's a Nazi. And I hate racism and I love music. And, um, you know, what will I do? And so I wrote a letter back to her, as was the style of that time. That was what has to happen. I wrote a letter and it just said, Right, Susan, you are rock against racism, Aberystwyth. Get on with it. And one of the things that came out of it as well was the people who were at the centre of Ra were all 60s people who'd been through the 60s. They'd been through Vietnam solidarity, love-ins, hippie dope, everything. We'd, so they had some experience of organising things and putting on festivals and gigs. So it wasn't totally new to them. But was there a concert you, you know, which emerged that you, you sort of went to and said, my goodness, look where we are now, having, yeah. having started with a letter? Unbelievable. I mean, when we did the uh, Victoria Park, Carnival with um, Steel Pulse, who came out dressed in... That was 78. That was 78. So we had The Clash, who were the leading political punk band at that time. We had Tom Robinson, who was at that time just had the hit with Sing If You're Glad To Be Gay. Mm. So you had all the politics, not just racism, but everything about oppression was mixed up. Steel Pulse came on stage, black reggae band from Hansworth in Birmingham, came on stage dressed in Ku Klux Klan outfits and sang their song, Ku Klux Klan. It was just incredible. And so uh, that gig had Polly Styrin, who, who, who's passed away, sadly, who sang the incredible song, Oh, Bondage Up Yours, as a young punk feminist. And I remember running out on stage, I was comparing the gig, and I remember running out onto stage, and I just was overwhelmed with the amount of people. And I just screamed, This ain't no Woodstock. This is the carnival against the Nazis. And the crowd just went, Wah! And it just carried us through the rest of the day. Red Saunders, one of the all-time great campaigners. But join us after the break when we review how we dealt with politics last year with what Alex is very fond of calling our prestigious panel of political pundits. Join us then. Welcome back. Alex and I are reviewing some of our top shows from 2019. Brexit provided most of the copy, but we also took a look at the new era of political commentary by interviewing some of the top ten political bloggers. Yes, the, the top bloggers now make the political weather in the way that in days gone by it might have been an editorial in the Times. This is how Craig Murray, Slugger O'Toole, 
and Wings Over Scotland explain the personal background to the hugely successful blogging. So Stuart, tell me about this reverent business and the dog collar. I mean, what's what's it all about? Yeah, oh, that's a that's an odd one. I mean, partly it's just a it's just a bit of fun. It really winds some people up. But I, I originally um, started doing it because, firstly, just to make myself easier to find on the internet, because obviously Stuart Campbell's a, a really common name. There's millions of people. If you search for Stuart Campbell, there's there was a Scotland rugby player, a footballer, there's a famous there's a canoeist, there's a famous gynaecologist of all sorts of people. So by by becoming Reverend Stuart Campbell, I'm the only one of those. Let's dispense with the, the dog collar mm. before the, the unionist press says that you were impersonating a, a good reverend in the Alex Salmon show. I think we've had quite enough fun with him as it is. How did the Wings Over Scotland get started? Well yeah, I mean as you say after the after the the SNP majority in 2011, it was obvious there was going to be a referendum. Yeah, I remember that. And I've been, uh, yeah. And uh, I've, I've been an independence guy all my life. My dad used to work for Billy Wolfe, the former leader of the SNP in Bathgate. So guys, I wanted to make a contribution. Obviously, I couldn't go knocking on doors and stuff. So I thought I'll do something. Well, you could knock on the doors in Bath. Well, yeah. <laughs> it was, get an interesting reception. There's not, not a lot of votes to be won there, though, unfortunately. So, yeah, so I decided to, to do it online. And I tried. Uh, very brief. I looked for other Scottish politics websites and there weren't really any very good ones. I briefly wrote for one that was run by uh, a, a variety of people from various parties, but I wrote one article for them and I made a sort of joke in, in one of the comments and was immediately ostracised and disowned. And I thought, oh God, God I'm going to have to do this myself, aren't I? The first question is obvious. Why is Slugger O'Toole? Well, it, it started off as a letter to Slugger O'Toole. That was the full title of it. And Slugger O'Toole is a character out of a song, an old Irish song the called... Irish the, Rover. The Irish Rover. <laughs> and the line in that song goes... It's a piece of nonsense, but it's great crack. The line goes, Slugger O'Toole, who was drunk as a rule. And the, the original notion was that trying to explain Northern Ireland it was a bit like trying to explain anything to a drunk man. You had to kind of divvy it up in small amounts you have to be prepared to repeat yourself over and over, and you have to pre be prepared to take a very long time. Now, that was 17 years ago, and I have to say I didn't think it was going to take this long, but there it is, we're still going strong. So how are you getting on? Are we on the, we're ordering in the next round, or are you <laughs> making good progress? Well, you never know in Northern Irish politics when the next round's going to come, or indeed when the last round's going to be served. At the moment, it's pr pretty thin pickings. The Assembly's down now for two years, though, Wonderfully, nobody else in the rest of the whole of the United Kingdom seems to have noticed. But, you know, there's always talks around the corner. The, the, whatever, whatever falls over seems to... We do seem to be able to get it back up again. What moved you to say, right, I'm going to start a blog and it's going to be a Northern Irish politics? I had considered getting involved in, a, in and around the time of the Good Friday Agreement. Things seem to be getting exciting, but in a good way. Um, this conflict had been going on for most... of. It's 1969, I was 10 years of age, and at 10 years of age you don't know what's going on, except the place that you've grown up in that seemed to be the most boring political backwater that, that God ever invented, suddenly became the focus of all this kind of world politics and conflict. And where did you grow conflict. up? Like, tell me about your, your own background. Well, I grew up in a small town outside Belfast called Hollywood, which, which was a mixed community. Very close to Belfast, um, uh, and I mean, so much so that when the bombs went off, you could hear it, but you could hear it at a distance. Craig Murray, many of the things you write about, you know, advocacy of Scottish independence, you know, have you marked down as a, as a pretty, uh, a pretty thrown Scot, uh, a lad of peers? But actually, you, you were born in, in Norfolk, were you not? I was indeed. I, I was uh, born down in Norfolk. Um, cause my father, Sir Edinburgh, um, was posted down there in the Air Force, where he married uh, a local girl and settled down for a while. So I'm, I'm, I'm half Scots and half English and, and, and born in Norfolk. And got in politics at a pretty early age. I mean, reading uh, uh, accounts of your life, uh, Mr Jeremy Thorpe, then leader of the Liberal Party, the right honourable Jeremy Thorpe, uh, his private secretary received a a letter in the post, because uh, that's what they did in these days, and uh, just the run-up to the February 1974 election. What was that about? <laughs> that's right. Um, I decided I was a Liberal uh, when I was, I think, 14 years old, and we didn't have a candidate in North Norfolk. We didn't have a constituency association. So I wrote to Jeremy Forp asking him to send a candidate, 
and his private secretary, who was Richard Moore, opened the letter and having no constituency himself, uh, hopped on a train and came to fight the election. Uh, and when he arrived and found uh, that a, <laughs> a young teenager was w w was the constituency association, he was. What age were you then? I, I was just fifteen, I think. It was fascinating to note that after the series on online bloggers, the Facebook views of this show soared into the hundreds of thousands. Yes, indeed. Now, last year, with the, the Brexit denouement looming, we decided to convene a regular panel of pundits to tell us what was going to happen. And as to be said, from the Tory leadership stakes to the Christmas election itself, our prestigious panel did not let us down. Anyone who followed their political tips would have come up with more winners than losers. When we're considering this, this new race at uh, Royal Ascot, uh, this, the Tory leadership stakes, what, do you, what qualities do you require to, to emerge as, a, as the winner of this race? Well, it's very like uh, studying the, the, the results of any race. You have to look at, uh, at ability to form over course uh, and distance. Have they got the class? Look at the ownership, the trainers. You've got to make all of these assessments. Can they cope with the going? Have they been? Uh, have they taken any noxious substances? All of these that matters need to be taken into account. The main Brexit case was that this Westminster Parliament was meant to be sovereign against a somewhat mythologised view of the European Union. To then abolish that very Parliament to get through Brexit, I, I think will be an act too far. But when you say, can these disparate people unite around their opposition to that, without hesitation, yes. All the debates are about the mechanisms. How do you stop a government from doing such a thing? How do you stop a government determined to go out with a no deal, if that's what happens? Um, but are they theoretically united to stop the proroguing of Parliament and to stop no deal? Yes. And I think the sense of that will intensify over the coming weeks rather than the opposite. The, 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 they can't agree on a vote of confidence. They don't agree that the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, should become short-term Prime Minister. But they do agree on these other matters. And they will find a way, I think, uh, to make that absolutely clear. And I think the logic of this situation, where you have a minority Prime Minister trying to enforce his will over a, a parliament which disagrees with him, the, the, natural, um, the natural outcome of that would be an election. To... We are in a parliamentary democracy. Nobody could object to that. And I'm joined from Glasgow by the doyen of Scottish political journalism, a woman who's been covering Scottish elections since the last winter election of 1974. I'm delighted to be joined by Ruth Wishart. I'm not sure I'm delighted to be carbon dated quite like that, Alex. Now, now Ruth, the, the, party, the main party leaders, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Boris Johnson, have both been in Scotland, but neither visit was uh, an unalloyed success. Not at all. In fact, Boris Johnson has taken a leaf out of the Theresa May playbook and he's been going round in kind of hermetically sealed posses. I mean, he went to, into a distillery, but only, uh, only journalists and authorised people were allowed in. There was no punters allowed in to ask him questions. And when somebody remonstrated with him from the press corps, he said, well, you're a voter, aren't you? So he's, he's, he's been kept well away from anything resembling the electorate. And Jeremy Corbyn, well, Jeremy Corbyn came up and uh, had a lot of difficulty. First of all, he changed his pitch on a second independence referendum three times in the space of two days, which is never much of a good look. And then he got heckled about his views on terrorism. So, no, I don't think they'll look back with fondness on their Scottish sojourn. The Liberals and Labour would get their act together much more. They're, they're fighting each other. They obviously hate each other more than the, they hate the Tories, which is quite unusual. Um, and to the left, there hasn't been anything like a Romainer alliance, which I thought might develop. And on the other side, we've seen what I'm quite convinced, although it's conflicting signals, that there's been some form of deal between the Bre Farage and, and, and the Tories, which means that the Brexit threat to the Tory vote has, has really capsized. Well, let me open. That was your point. You said if there was such a deal, 
uh, then it would be plain sailing for, for Boris Johnson. But, but Nigel Farage says it was a unilateral deal. It doesn't seem to be much of a deal when he withdraws his candidates and, and doesn't get anything for it. Well, I was right about the deal. And whether it's unilateral or behind closed doors, it doesn't matter. What uh, Farage has done has given, is given uh, the Tories a clear run in 317 seats. Now, there's still a slight problem here, because in some of the other marginal seats, the Farage threat could still be something of a problem. But by and large, they've got that clear run. There is another deal as well, which we've forgotten about, the Lib Dems, the Greens and Plaid Cymru, the Welsh Nationalists, but that's virtually irrelevant. I don't think Plaid Cymru were expecting to win many seats in Kent, for example. Uh, and so, as a result of that, we've got the exact deal I thought was necessary to get the Conservatives that overall majority, which I predicted the last time. Yeah, at the start of the campaign, we had a discussion here, and Lembic Opic predicted that Boris Johnson would win quite easily. Uh, and I said, no, I think it's quite likely to be a hung parliament. And I have to say that so far he's been proved uh, more um, a, a more gifted uh, forecaster than me. I mean, the, the two things which have happened to um, change my mind uh, is, one, the failure of anything like a Remain alliance. The, re the, le the left is fighting each other. And secondly, the, the, the subsidence of the Brexit party. And so I'd now say that the chances are that you'll have a fairly easy uh, Boris Johnson majority, and then we'll leave the European Union a few weeks after that. But could you be wrong again? Could there be a, a, a difference? <laughs> could it be a game of two halves? You ask me, of course I could be wrong again. Are you hoping to be wrong again? I think what would be best for this country is a hung parliament. Yes. So our panel was more or less spot on. But then lots of people forecast the election result, but next to nobody forecast this Christmas cracker. But one to watch is Jo Swinson's own seat. She needs to remember what happened to Nick Clegg in Sheffield Hallam when he was leader and he lost. And that is how Lembit Opic became the official Mystic Meg of our election programmes. And so, Taz, what's coming up in this new decade? Well, next week we'll be picking up on one of the unresolved issues of the election, the constitutional future of Scotland. And then we return to the abiding issue of homelessness. We feature both those making practical efforts to help the homeless on the streets of London and look at an academic effort to address this most intractable of social problems. And so from Taz and me and all at the show, it's goodbye for now. <laughs>